Hey everyone, this is Mike from the Comic Book Trove, back today with another Omnibus review. And today I'm going to be taking a look at the third and final Omnibus volume of Jeff Johns' Green Lantern epic. Having previously taken a look at volumes one and two on the channel, I'm going to look at the final concluding chapter today and see how this incredible run all comes to an end and discuss that in some detail. So, if you haven't already, feel free to check out my previous reviews on these two volumes. But here and now, I'm going to dive into volume three. I'm going to discuss the book, take a look through it, showcase it a little bit. Uh, maybe give you a bit of information on the run if you aren't too familiar with it. But without any further ado, I'm going to dive into this book now and take a look through it in more detail. So stick around. Okay, so here we are with the Green Lantern by Jeff Johns Omnibus Volume 3. Now, having already discussed Volumes 1 and 2 on the channel, if you've checked those videos out, you'll already be aware of just how well I regard this run overall. And I've got to say straight away, before I even take a look in this book, that um, all in all, this is a really satisfying conclusion to the run. If you've read through the stuff in Volumes 1 and 2, I have no doubt whatsoever that you would enjoy this book as well. Um, really, it's just a run that I think is well worth checking out and uh, something that I really enjoy reading through every now and again. Just taking a look at the dust jacket here. So it's a very similar design overall to the, the previous two. Uh, on the back of the book here, you get a little bit of uh, information about what's in here in terms of the storytelling, get the uh, information of the contents that are collected in here. Some of the creators are listed there as well. And I will say, though, I have a slight issue with this omnibus, one point of criticism that, uh, that bugs me with it compared to the other two. So I mentioned in my reviews of, uh, of the other two that when these book cover events, which crossed over with other Lantern series that were ongoing at the same time as the main Green Lantern series, which Jeff Johns was writing, and which is what you primarily get in this set of three omnibuses, um, what they generally tended to do was put in the relevant issues of, for example, Green Lantern Core, so that you got pretty much the full story there, or at least enough of the story that you didn't feel like anything was missing. What happens in the final sort of third or so of this book here, this omnibus in particular, the last two events that make up Jeff John's run, which were the uh, Rise of the Third Army and the Ra Wrath of the Lanterns events, uh, Wrath of the First Lantern event, I should say, um, those books aren't collected properly in here. You only get the Green Lantern books um, from those relevant events, and which actually means you have a huge chunk of those stories missing. So if you just read this omnibus, that was really the only point in reading all three omnibuses where I felt like it really hurt the reading experience by not including any of those issues. And that is why I have these two trade paperbacks here, which collect those two events. So Rise of the Third Army and uh, Wrath of the First Lantern because I actually believe that it's a better idea to get a more holistic reading experience if you reach the point in this story, in this omnibus, where you get to that stage. I actually prefer to then jump off and start reading these two trade paperbacks, because these include, for example, uh, relevant issues of um, not only the Green Lantern series, which is what you get in the omnibus, but also Green Lantern Core, Red Lanterns, and a series called New Guardians as well, which were all ongoing during the New 52. Um, which is when this part of the run took place in the New 52 era. Um, so those two books are a better way to read those last two events, in my opinion, because as it is in the omnibus here, you don't really get the full reading experience at all, to say the least. In fact, you get a very fractured reading experience, which does actually make the very end of this book, unfortunately, if you're reading the omnibus specifically, um, a bit... Uh, almost anticlimactic really, which is a real shame because overall reading these three omnibuses is such an amazing experience. And I just want to show this wraparound image as well, which comes from pretty much the very end of the run. Really cool image on there, really like that. But uh, I want to give a spoiler warning now then, as I tend to do when I look through a book like this, because uh, I will show some stuff off, discuss some key plot points. And whilst I won't attempt to cover everything because you know it's a massive thick book we've got here, um, it, uh, it might be the case that I discuss something or mention something you maybe don't want to know. If, uh, if you're not familiar with the run in too much detail and you'd rather experience it spoiler free, you know, I'd hate to ruin that for anybody who, who wanted to experience it fresh. So, you know, fair warning. But uh, if you're already familiar with the run or just not bothered about spoilers, of course, feel free to stick around. Um, so we're picking up from where volume two left off, unsurprisingly. So we're in the aftermath here of the Blackest Night event. And... Really, yeah, the story's carrying on from there. We're seeing more exploration of the relationship between Hal Jordan and Carol Ferris, uh, who is Star Sapphire at this point again. Sinestro, you know, he's still involved. The other members of the other Lantern Corps, like uh, Laugh Lee's here, Agent Orange. It's actually Orange Lantern. You know, you've got the Blue Lanterns, um, Red Lanterns, all these different Lantern Corps. 
And as I mentioned in my review of Volume 2, this whole aspect of Jeff John's run on this, uh, this series with the other lantern cores, all the different emotional spectrum cores and different colours, it's really my favourite thing of this whole run. I just think it's really, really good. Um, in terms of artwork, again, strong artwork through here. Not quite as good as the artwork that we saw primarily by Ivan Reyes in Volume 2. Um, the pencil through a lot of this part of the uh, the run is uh, Doug Mank. I think that's how you pronounce it, Mankey. Um, yeah, might be mispronouncing that, but anyway, yeah, he's the primary artist and does a really good job overall, I think, you know. Um, as I say, maybe not quite as great as some of the previous artwork, but honestly, that was such a high standard that was set during that Blackest Night era of this run that um, it would be a little bit hard to beat that. But by no means is the artwork in here bad. You know, I really don't want to come across as though I feel that way. Um, overall, it's really strong. And, you know, just page after page of stuff like this, when these different lanterns are unleashing their powers and all these different lights and, uh, you know, are flying around. It really makes the artwork in this run, I suppose in Green Lantern as a whole, really quite distinct. You know, it's got a very unique look, this series. It's, I really like the overall style um, that ran through this whole run and, and really through Green Lantern as a whole, if you read a lot of Green Lantern comics, really. But uh, yeah, really good stuff. Um, we get these entities here. Um, the first storyline really starts off with these different entities breaking out and causing problems. Uh, these are the emotional entities that control the powers that the different core harness with their coloured rings. Um, yeah, it's it's really interesting stuff. You know, it's um, hard not to discuss it in too much detail, which I'm conscious of doing because, uh, you know, these would turn into extremely long videos if I did so. Um, there is this funny little story here, though. This is um, like a, an annual or a one-shot, a Christmas story featuring Laughleys, where he discovers what Christmas is. And with his whole thing being that he harnesses the power of greed and avarice, um, he decides he wants basically everything that exists for Christmas. Um, it's a bit of a kind of tongue-in-cheek sort of comedic story, but it's very fun. Um, then you get back to the main story, of course. And we start to see as well, I mean, this has been hinted at up until this point, but uh, the guardians of Oa, who are in charge of the Green Lantern Corps, we start to really... It, it, they're true intentions and motivations start to really come into question during this part of the run more and more as it's kind of brought up as to whether or not they are in fact the good guys they claim to be whether they actually have the galaxy's best interest at heart or if they've actually got some ulterior motive as to why they've set up the green lantern core and why you know they do what they do um and that kind of leads into a civil war between the green lanterns and this story called war of the green lanterns so this is uh you know, one of the events that runs through. And again, it's weird when I mentioned what they did with those last two events and missing some issues out, because in, in this event, for example, you do get some Green Lantern Corps issues that make this story up, so you get a good reading experience for this. It's just all at the end where it all kind of falls apart a little bit, but I do like this bit where um, the human Green Lanterns are temporarily relieved of their green rings, so they have to um, temporarily use different core rings. And I think this actually led into Guy Gardner becoming a Red Lantern um, full-time later on down the line. Pretty sure he actually did join the Red Lantern Corps in the New 52 era, if I'm remembering rightly. Um, but it's cool anyway to see all these different characters harnessing different uh, rings and trying to figure out how they use those rings rather than the Green Lantern rings they used to. Um, Really interesting stuff and, you know, great artwork again running through all of this, really. Got to, got to say that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of action. I mean, as you can see, just flicking through the pages, you get a lot of, uh, of high stakes, cosmic level action. Um, part of what makes this just a true space slash cosmic epic story, really. You know, it, it's uh, if you've got any kind of enjoyment for this kind of... Uh, I don't know, high stakes, large scale sci-fi storytelling. I would have to think that you'd, you'd get a lot of enjoyment out of reading this run if you get the opportunity to do so. Um, but as always, I want to put the question out there to people who have read this book already, you know, the run as a whole, this omnibus in particular, etc. Um, what do you think about it? You know, what do you think about this final part of the run as it goes into the New 52 era, which is here actually, this is Green Lantern number one as of the New 52, where Hal Jordan is no longer a Green Lantern, but Sinestro, does become a Green Lantern again. Pretty controversial move, given that he was uh, acting as a Yellow Lantern and a primary enemy of the Green Lantern Corps. But he's back to being a somewhat reluctant Green Lantern here. And he partners up with Hal Jordan again. Um, 
this is really the last part of the run though, this new 52 era where I just feel like it did all get a little bit weaker, you know, in quality. The storytelling just dipped a little bit um, towards the end. And I think that was largely because of just the sheer number of different ongoing Green Lantern series that they had at this point, you know, because like I say, they had Green Lantern Core, New Guardians and Red, Lan uh, Red Lanterns all running alongside each other. And the characters were therefore kind of split up. So Carol Ferris, who'd been getting into a, a relationship again with Hal Jordan and we'd been following that through, she basically disappears from the story here because she started regularly appearing in, I believe, New Guardians with Kyle Rayner. Um, so she's kind of in this story early on um, and then she disappears and we don't see her again until the very end because, as I say, this book only gives you the Green Lantern issues and none of the other issues, which is fair enough, except that it, at times it would be nice to get some of those issues to really fill in the story, but I don't know if it was an issue with just page count because I guess if you put in all the issues that are in the trade paperbacks that I've mentioned and shown off, this would be an even thicker book than it already is and it's a pretty thick book already. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so we're getting to the point where there is one more significant change before we reach those final two events, and that's the introduction of a new character that Jeff Johns created and set up to be a new Green Lantern. And we'll, we'll get to that momentarily. But just here, there's a story with um, Black Hand. He is back again. First time we've seen him since Blackest Night in this Revenge of the Black Hand story arc, which features Hal Jordan and Sinestro trying to uh, to stop him as he uh, tries to continue his work and his obsession with death. It's very uh, grim stuff, really, you know? This The whole um, Black Lantern thing with the dead coming back to life, etc. Quite creepy stuff. Obviously, that was on full show in, uh, in the Blackest Night event itself, but... You know, we're seeing a bit more of it here with this character, Black Hand, who was at the centre of that event. Um, here's where we see the new character, though. So, this guy here, Simon Baz, who, I may be wrong about this, but I think was, if not the first, certainly one of the first um, Muslim characters featured in DC Comics. And he's introduced as a new character here and becomes a Green Lantern but has absolutely no idea how to use the ring early on because the ring just finds him, decides he's a suitable Green Lantern candidate, um, and therefore he's just got this ring now, he doesn't really know what to do with it. And I think the Justice League come after him as well due to some classic kind of misunderstanding. Yeah, we see that here, the Justice League show up. Um, but then we move into, this is the final couple of story arcs really from this point onwards, it's the rise of the Third Army and Wrath of the First Lantern stories which, as I mentioned already a couple of times, make up the, uh, the final two events of, of Jeff John's whole saga. So it really is towards only towards the end of the book, and we've only got that many pages left. So this kicks off, so it's not even the last third like I thought it was. It's, it's even less than that, but um, it starts here, you know? Where, and it's just weird because, like I say, you're only getting the Green Lantern issues from this point onwards, and if you just read the Green Lantern issues, you're really not getting enough of the story to understand and appreciate what's actually happening. Because during this part, Hal Jordan is kind of stuck in this sort of black and white, dead uh, sort of um, afterworld, uh, afterlife kind of thing. Underworld, underworld afterlife, those are the words I'm looking for. Um, and whilst he's in there, all kinds of crazy things are going on, you know, in, in the real world, if you want to call it that. Um, fighting against the Guardians, basically, who've kind of gone crazy. That's what ends up happening. And um, this first Lantern character turns out to be a pretty major antagonist. Um, but you're really not seeing the full scale of what's actually going on in these stories because of the, the sheer number of issues that are missing from this particular omnibus collection. So by the time it all kind of wraps up towards the end, although it feels somewhat satisfying because it serves as a conclusion, of course, to the whole event, uh, the whole run up until this point, um, it feels a little bit anticlimactic because you haven't actually seen this full story come to an end. But I will still say that the final pages of the final issue, which we're pretty much seeing here now, I think, this is, this is the, like the final confrontation, the final saga. Um, one of my favourite conclusions, I think, to any kind of large story in comics, certainly, um, that I've ever read so far. 
it, uh, it's kind of a throwback to a lot of things that have come up already in the run up to this point. Um, it really feels like a natural conclusion to the story. And as much as any series can do when it's part of an ongoing series like Green Lantern, you know, where, you know, obviously this was the end of Jeff Johns' run, but it was not, of course, the end of Green Lantern. Um, but there is this nice little epilogue sequence as well where we get like a look into a possible future and we see what happened to a lot of the main characters who've featured in here. And uh, it just has a, a real kind of ending feel to it. And then we get this final amazing double page spread, which just rounds off the run amazingly with a lot of these characters, pretty much every character who's featured during the story um, in any degree of importance anyway. And I just really love it. You know, I, I can't say enough positive things about it. I'm a huge fan of this run. It's, uh, it's one of my favorites of all time. I just think it's, it's one of those that's very highly regarded and rightly so. I would definitely recommend that anybody checks out these three books if you get the chance to do so. And there's some cover uh, variant covers here in the back as well. Just a nice different array of artwork here. I'm liking all this. But yeah, all in all, just a top quality run. I'm a big fan. Would love to hear if, uh, if others like it as much as I do. Um, oh, there's a nice little goodbye as well from Jeff Johns there when he uh, came off the series after his many years writing this. But that's that, everybody. So uh, thank you, as always, for sticking with me and watching this all the way through. If you have done, appreciate that, as always. And I will come back again soon to discuss something else. Thanks again.